years. He then went on to the IAS at Princeton, and now he's at Berkeley. And today he's going to tell us uh, about uh, dark matter, how it doesn't matter as much as well. <laughs> All right, so the topic of my talk, um, or at least sort of the red thread that's been tied all the different pieces together, is indeed dark matter. And I've done a lot of, a lot of my work has been with numerical simulations, so that will be the other focus. Um, but as you can tell from the title and also from my abstract, if you read it, even though dark matter makes up 80% you know, of all the matter in the universe, it's not all that really matters. There's an additional material up there, baryons that you and I are made up of, and, and of course the stars and galaxies that we actually observe. So in, the, in um, part of this talk, in the second half or so, two thirds of it, I'll be talking about how baryonic uh, processes um, change the picture uh, from just the dominated dark matter. So with this, uh, with this audience, I don't really have to go into sort of the historical background of why we think that the universe is dominated by dark matter. I'm going to assume you know that, that uh, most of the matter in the universe is in this mysterious dark form. Um, I'm also going to assume that you've heard of cold dark matter or the idea that dark matter is a particle, a fundamental particle. Um, that could arise in extensions of the standard model of uh, particle physics, for example. So instead, maybe as an intro, I'll start with this. Um, this plot, you've probably seen this before too, this is uh, just the power spectrum of uh, density, dark matter density fluctuations according to linear theory extrapolated to today. So it's actually plotting k cubed times p of k. And then this is the wave number k, so smaller scales here on the right. And the solid yellow line is the prediction from cold dark matter theory. And you can see that it rises towards smaller scales. And that means that smaller scales become nonlinear first, and that gives rise to the hierarchical uh, nature of structure formation in the universe. The small scales collapse first and merge to form larger scales. You can also see I've highlighted here on the uh, unity, the sort of uh, dividing line between linear scales and nonlinear scales. So on very large scales, even today, the universe remains linear, and you can do analytical calculations. But then eventually, as you go to smaller scales, it becomes nonlinear and eventually very nonlinear. So and that's uh, why you need numerical simulations in this regime. You really, uh, it's hard to do just purely uh, analytical calculations. So that's the motivation for doing um, numerical work that I'll be talking about. And then the last thing I'm showing this one is kind of a dividing line uh, vertically here, where on the left, we actually have observational constraints that I'm not actually plotting on here, but uh, from the CMB and from galaxy clustering and from the line not before us, we actually have a pretty good idea of what the power spectrum of density fluctuations is, and it agrees really well with the predictions of cold dark matter theory. Then as you go here to the right, it's uh, kind of not so clear anymore. All of a sudden, we don't have very many observational constraints. And so if you just believe it's actually cold dark matter, then uh, this power spectrum will just continue to rise towards far to the right here, and eventually there'll be a cutoff down there. Um, but we don't really know. It could be some other um, particle, maybe a warm dark matter particle, in which case it has some residual thermal uh, pressure, so to speak, that cuts off um, the density fluctuations at a, at a larger scale, just below where we have observational constraints. Or it could be something even more complicated, like this uh, atomic dark matter model, where there's an additional degrees of freedom in the dark sector, and you might get you know, dark acoustic oscillations and all kinds of uh, other crazy physics that uh, we would like to uh, test. Um, all right, so from a numerical simulations point of view, you can sort of <coughs> divide this into two realms. On the large scale, we have cosmic scale simulations, which I'm sure you guys have seen movies of the millennium simulations, for example. Uh, those are very useful for you know, just uh, measuring in the simulations the distribution of dark matter, um, the fact that it's not completely uniform, that it shows voids and filament to the walls. Um, it's also good for just getting halo statistics and uh, learning about the relationships between the halo mass and their concentrations, for example. Um, you can go to smaller scales, um, there's uh, galactic scale dark matter simulations. So these are now no longer trying to resolve a representative volume of the whole universe, but instead focus all of their computational effort in on one halo. And those are useful for learning density and velocity dispersion profiles in dark matter halos, and in particular about learning about the substructure, uh, so the remnants of this hierarchical merging process um, that populate um, all these dark matter halos. Now, um, Right, so why, why, what's the connection here between uh, the simulations and trying to learn what dark matter is? So we have kind of three different main drivers in which we can hope to learn more about what the nature of the dark matter particle is, and that sort of characterize them here by these three boxes. One is astrophysical probes, you know, just by looking at, out at the Milky Way and learning what, are the, what is the taking a census of the Milky Way, dwarf satellite galaxies, that gives us some idea about the abundance of dark matter halos on small scales, so you can compare that to predictions from theory, and that can tell you something about uh, of dark matter. Or gravitational lensing, of course, you can directly probe the dark matter in, uh, in uh, stereolactic halos and also the substructure within them to 
then we have two kind of particle physics-y uh, drivers, uh, ways to learn about dark matter. One is indirect detection, referring to the hope of uh, measuring the annihilation products of dark matter. Um, so dark matter can annihilate and produce gamma rays or antiparticles or neutrinos, and you can hope to detect those and learn about dark matter in that way. And then lastly, direct detection, in which you're trying to uh, measure the scattering of uh, dark matter particles of nuclei in underground detectors and learn about the nature of dark matter through those experiments. But all, all of these, I think, uh, depend on the predictions from numerical simulations in one way or another, and that's sort of highlighted here in this kind of matrix where on the horizontal direction I'm just giving a lot of these different um, scales in which uh, numerical simulations are making predictions for the distributions of dark matter, large scale structure, the properties of individual halos, the abundance uh, of substructure within them, and also their properties, and even the local density distribution. And then on the vertical axis here, it means just these different probes, um, observational probes from astronomical and also particle physics experiments. And all of them have, in some way, a connection depend on the prediction of a numerical simulation. So for example, gravitational lensing, if you care about flux ratio anomalies due to the presence of subhalos, then of course you need to know how many subhalos they are, what is their internal density profile, and a lot of that is, uh, has to come from the numerical simulations because it's such a highly nonlinear regime. Yeah. So and most of the um, mechanisms you're listing on the left look familiar, but what do you refer to by Milky Way dwarfs? So these are dwarf satellites around the- Oh, dwarf satellites, yeah. yeah. So that would just be the abundance of the missing satellites problems. I'll get to those in a little bit. So the, in terms of numerical simulations, this is kind of the state of the art. Um, in terms of dark matter only, large scale simulations uh, that are all, all the way down to uh, relative zero. On the cosmic scale, you know, there's the millennium simulations, there's a, uh, this DS uh, full universe run. And in fact, this is already, I made this slide you know, a few months ago, and it's already out of date. There's even bigger simulations now. But, um, these, at this time, we're using up to a half a trillion particles. Now there's ones that use even more than a trillion particles. The particle masses that they have in this case that are 10 to the 12, so clearly you cannot learn anything about the internal structure of individual halos. Um, but you can uh, run larger uh, simu simulations in slightly smaller volumes, and you can get some of the statistics of um, individual halos too. And then going down to smaller scales, we go from these sort of cosmic scale simulations to zoom-ins, cluster scale, and then galactic scale simulations. Um, and there, the state of the art is sort of billion particle. So you can't do quite as many particles because you're resolving much, much more higher into the nonlinear regime. And the particle masses that people can resolve, for example, here in the Aquarius one or in the Via Lactea or G here is about a few thousand solar masses. And you can get four softening resolutions of tens of um, parsecs out of these. Um, so this is the work that I've been more involved in, in, in is the sort of galactic scale simulations. So let me just show one of them. The Alakia simulation, you've heard about this before. Here's a little movie that's showing not the whole computational volume, but just the central 800 kiloparsecs. It's embedded in a much larger volume of about 40 megaparsecs. And it's just following the, the dark matter density evolution. Um, here's sort of just four snapshots. Initially, the box is expanding, and then under um, the influence of gravity, it pulls together all this uh, matter and uh, starts forming uh, dark matter subhalo. And then as you can see by, by this movie, this merging process is not complete. There's still lots of remnant little sub halos that are orbiting in the potential of these more massive halos. And those are, of course, uh, have uh, um, created a lot of interest uh, because there are potential uh, ways to try to detect the dark matter. Um, so you guys have seen these kind of simulations before, so I'll, I'll move on. Right, so in the next few slides, I'm just going to give some examples of how these dark matter only simulations have been useful for um, sort of quantifying our understanding and our expectations for several uh, detection mechanisms. So I'll briefly discuss indirect detection and then direct detection. And then for the remainder of the talk, I'll go uh, beyond these just dark matter only simulations. Um, so indirect detection, as I mentioned, that refers to the hope of measuring the annihilation product of dark matter. So in most dark in most models of what part of what dark matter is, it's its own antiparticles, so it's sufficiently high in dense regions, it can annihilate, and it can produce standard model particles. And those themselves won't be stable, they'll decay, patronize, and produce um, signals that we can potentially see, for example, gamma rays, or uh, electrons and positrons, or protons and antiprotons. And there's a wide range of experiments that are hoping to detect that. So for example, the Friendly Gamma Ray Space Telescope is, is hoping to detect the gamma ray signal from dark matter annihilation. There's ground-based atmospheric drain hub telescopes, this cube <coughs> neutrino signal, and uh, there's some space-based uh, missions, for example, the MS, that is trying to uh, detect the um, antiparticles, and those could be arising from dark matter annihilation. Um, 
right? So we can use the simulations. This is some, from some work I did uh, several years ago. We just went into the simulations and observed them, like, for example, Fermi, the Fermi satellite would. And so in this case, we're just summing up the line of sight integral of density squared in all the different directions of the sky. And in a way, this would be a, a prediction for uh, not uh, for what the, the dark matter annihilation sky should look like. And so you can clearly see the galactic center is very bright here. In, in the center of this projection. But the point we were making here is that even though this is nominally the brightest source, it might also be interesting to look at a lot of these uh, little sub as uh, potential annihilation sources. Um, so we put up this paper before the launch of uh, Fermi at the time it was called BLAST. And uh, while well, this is some actual data from, from Fermi, first of all, we have here, uh, this is actually already a few years old. This is, I think, the two years back now. Uh, so it's clearly the Milky Way plane, the gamma rays, and then um, a lot of these uh, dark matter sub -tables. Uh, now, of course, I'm joking, and none of them are dark matter subfields. They've all been uh, identified with astrophysical sources. So at the moment, there hasn't been any um, any plausible or believable detections of uh, dark matter annihilation in the gamma ray sky. A little bit disappointing, but you know that just means that uh, the dark matter wasn't sufficiently low mass or didn't have a sufficiently high annihilation cross section to uh, to have led to a detectable signal so far. Um, of course, then in the absence of a signal, you can make exclusion plots. So this is now from looking at the uh, annihilation signal at uh, the locations of dwarf galaxies, where you know there should be a, a large amount of dark matter, and then you can get an expectation for how much luminosity they should be producing, and then convert the absence of a signal in Fermi into exclusion limits. And this is comparing to some of the uh, actual models that come out of, for example, minimal supersymmetric models of dark matter. You can see it's starting, especially when you stack the dwarf, the signal from many dwarfs is starting to eat into the parameter space, but there's also quite a lot of models, in particular the ones that actually reproduce the relative abundance of dark matter that are not currently not yet um, excluded. So um, we could have gotten lucky, but we didn't, and so instead the game is becoming more constraining um, the parameter space. So that was indirect detection. Um, now moving on to direct detection, there the idea is uh, to try to measure the recoil of a dark matter particle scattering off of a nucleus, imparting some recoil energy on the order of tens of kV over typical speeds and dark matter particle masses. And so you can try to detect that. There's many different ways of doing it, either in sort of super cooled crystals, where you might try to detect the phonon signals, the actual vibrations, or you can try to detect the scintillation signal or the ionization signal, for example, in these liquid xenon detectors. And there's a quite a big effort, big effort um, going on all over the world, oftentimes in underground labs. And this is the current situation. This actually already is um, a little bit out of date. There's some more recent um, exclusion curves from the Xenon 100 experiment, which is currently kind of leading, uh, leading the pack. Uh, so what, what these are are just exclusion curves in terms of the mass of the dark matter particle versus the um, nucleon cross-section. Um, you know, this, you know, this is uh, for spin independent, and you have to make some assumptions about what is the distribution of uh, the speeds of dark matter particles, and I'll get to that in a minute. But as long as you make the same assumptions, you can put all these uh, experiments on the same plot. And you can see there's um, exclusion curves. These are uh, curves from CDMS and from Xenon, which say that the dark matter particle cannot have a greater inter interaction cross-section at a given mass. But then there's also some intriguing um, actual closed contours, which refer to some experiments that have actually been reporting signals that are consistent with the dark matter um, detection. So there's the signal from Dama, of course, that uh, has been around for a long time based on a, um, an annual modulation signal. And then there's a more recent report by Cogent and also by Cress. Um, and as you can see, they, they don't all completely agree with each other, but they seem to be kind of close to each other, um, these three kind of signal um, regions. But then on the other hand, they also are in conflict with the limits from uh, 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 CDMS and from Xeno. So there's some kind of tension that we would like to explain. So one thing that I mentioned is that these exactly where these different uh, curves and exclusion curves um, land depends on the assumptions you make about the, the behavior of dark matter on at the Earth scale. Um, so there again, we can use our simulations to try to, to say something. A typical assumption that people make is that the dark matter is distributed in a Maxwellian. So this is now plotting the speed distribution of dark matter at, you know, at Earth. Um, and so the, the typical assumption that people make here is that it's a Maxwellian distribution. Um, what we found in the simulation is that if you actually measure the speed distribution of particles at 8 kiloparsecs in the simulation, like the Dialectia simulation, you find that uh, it's not really Maxwellian. There's clearly a deficit here at the peak. This is what's shown here by this red line. And there's an excess at higher velocities. And then furthermore, if you look at individual locations, you sample the speed distribution not just in a spherical shell, but at individual locations, 
you'll find that occasionally you have spikes at given velocities, and those correspond to the presence of a subhalo or of a tidal stream passing through your sample volume. So those are kind of interesting uh, because you, know, you might expect a lot more um, events above a certain energy corresponding to uh, a spike. So these kind of departures, I think, should be folded into um, the analysis into some degree they are now. And we may actually have data from our simulations available, so some analyses have actually been able to, to use that. But um, people have, have shown that if you allow for very general departures from Maxwellian, you can bring these three curves, the Donmark signal and the crest region and the cogent region, to agree with each other because they all depend on different ranges of velocity of the speed distribution. So you can actually make them agree at one particular mass that these overlap. So that's good. But on the other hand, it's not currently possible to also evade the constraints from CMS and Xenon. So that is a bit disappointing. That doesn't, doesn't quite uh, work with just departures from this uh, Maxwellian assumption. All right, so these are two examples of just cold dark matter only simulations, how they were useful for um, informing direct and indirect detection experiments. But now I want to move a little bit past that, and that's motivated in part by the small scale problems for dark matter. As you know, dark matter agrees very well for the predictions from numerical simulations and even just from analytical calculations, agree very well on large scales, um, CMD and the clustering of galaxies and the lambda number fours. But as you go to smaller scales, eventually you run into some problems, and these are kind of highlighted here by these, these three panels. There, there's the missing satellites problem that uh, you've probably heard about, which is just the kind of visually, visually demonstrated here by the discrepancy between the abundance of sub halos as predicted from the numerical simulations and the abundance of actual dark matter halos that we have measured to be orbiting the Milky Way galaxy in the form of dwarf galaxies, of which by um, recent count, there's about 20 of them, and uh, accounting for you know, the incomplete uh, sky coverage of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which has been detecting a lot of these might expect in total like 80 or 100 or so, but in the simulation there's you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, no matter how far, uh, it's, it's really just a function of um, the resolution of the simulation. Of course, most of these you don't expect to actually host uh, dwarf galaxies because they would be too low mass, so that's not really a fair comparison. But if you do the comparison properly, even though there's still kind of a, a residual disagreement, the disagreement becomes worse as you go towards lower masses and fainter systems. And the other, so I'm not going to say much more about that. Um, the other two that I want to spend a little bit more time on is the cusp core problem and the too big to fail problem. So let me move to that. Um, the cusp core problem just refers to the fact that the simulations all universally predict a density profile that tends to rise deeply towards the center. It's commonly described by an NFW profile in which the slope in the center um, goes as uh, 1 over r, the slope of the density profile. Uh, more recent high resolution simulations, actually, including the Alaktia and G Halo and also the Aquarius runs, have found that the true shape seems to be a bit better described by um, an Anasto profile, which is one more free parameter, so maybe it's not surprising that it does a little bit better job. That one actually asymptotes to a constant slope, so it doesn't actually have a cusp in the very center. But actually, to, uh, for the comparison with the observations, that's not really that relevant of a point because this rollover happens pretty gradually. Um, so it happens fairly far in. So where we actually have observations, it's still cusp even um, in, in an anastos uh, uh, profile. So the data from that is that showed that very nicely is just from uh, this paper by Julio Navarro showing here the, the logarithmic slope of the density profile versus the radius. The NFW prediction is this line here, um, which asks us to minus one. And then the data from several really high resolution dark matter only simulations um, departs from this and actually follows more of the straight line in this log log plot, which is corresponds to the Sinosco profile, which as you can tell, if you went arbitrarily closer to the center, would roll over and become asymptotically flat. Okay, but as I mentioned, the observations, there's some conflict here with the observations because you can actually measure it in dwarf systems in the local group and this nearby uh, faint uh, low surface brightness galaxies, you can actually get a handle on what is the underlying slope of the dark matter potential is by measuring the, either the velocities of stars or the velocity of kinematics of gas inside of these galaxies. Um, and so you can like, you know, make the assumption that these are actually a uh, uh, relaxed system. You can just do a genes analysis and invert these velocities and get an idea about the shape of the underlying potential. And, and those typically find that you cannot really accommodate a, such a cuspy profile, something that goes as 1 over r. Instead, they are consistent with more kind of shallower profiles that are in fact even being completely flat, having a kind of constant density core. This is from this thing sam uh, sample of dwarf galaxies. More recently, here this is a nice, um, more recent measurement in uh, two dwarf galaxies in the Milky Way, the Sculptor and Fornax galaxy. There, uh, Walker and Peña Rubia identified two distinct, uh, chemically distinct populations of stars. 
kind of separate them into one is like lower metallicity, it's like one is like higher metallicity, or they actually use different kinds of chemical tracers. And then those have different half light radii. So, again, from the kinematics of these stars, you can get two enclosed mass measurements, mass measurements at two different radii corresponding to these two different populations of stars. And then they found that the enclosed mass was not really consistent with uh, something that you know, goes as R squared, as you would get for one over R profile, but instead something that is more consistent with a constant density or at least shallower density profile. Um, so these are two uh, good examples where just the predictions from pure dark matter only simulations on small scales don't seem to really um, work out when you compare them to actual observational data of dwarf galaxies. Uh, now the too big to fail problem that's another uh, small scale problem that has recently come, uh, come to the forefront. And that's in a way possibly kind of the combination of the missing satellites problem and the cosmic core problem. So I'll spend just a minute explaining um, what this is. Uh, so Boylan, Michael Boylan Colchin pointed this out earlier in a paper earlier last year. Um, so what he did is went into the into the, into the uh, Aquarius simulations, which again are very high resolution dark matter only simulations that are payloads like the host and the Milky Way galaxy. They have a range of host masses ranging from a few times 10 to the 12 to maybe slightly below 10 to the 12. And so for all of the sub payloads in these simulations, he just calculated what are circular velocity curves, so enclosed mass over radius, uh, the square root of that. And that's what's shown here by all these lines, these colored lines, both solid and dotted lines are just sub payloads in, in these simulations. Then the nice thing is we actually have observational constraints for where a lot of these dwarf galaxies lie on the same kind of plot. Um, this turns out that a given radius uh, corresponding to about the half-life radius of these uh, the stars in these systems, the uncertainty due to the anisotropy of orbits is minimized. So you get actually a fairly decent uh, constraint on the enclosed mass of these systems. Again, under the assumption that they're not undergoing strong tidal interactions. Um, so you can apply a kind of gene analysis. And so these are overplotted on top of these curves, on uh, these panels. So these are these data points with error bars. Um, and as you can see, the first, the nice thing to see is that every one of them, you can easily find a sub halo that uh, goes through them. Um, so that means we don't have any problems finding sub halos in the simulations that can host these sub these that observed or So that's good. But the problem really comes when you look in the upper regions. There always seem to be a population of subhalos that have been predicted in the simulations that are too dense to, or too massive um, at that radius to, to host these kind of dwarf galaxies. But these are the lines uh, plotted here in solid lines. They always seem to be, there's always, in, in every one of these cases, and, uh, there, there seems to be some uh, population of subhalos that are too massive to host them. So that's referred to as the too big to fail problem. And the name just comes from the fact that you might expect some kind of mass dependent threshold on uh, star formation inside sub halos. So it's a bit puzzling that you have lower mass systems that were able to form stars and then still have some population of more massive sub halos that were not. So they really should have, uh, they are really kind of too big to not have been able to form stars. They're too big to, to fail. So this is the too big to fail problem. So in the following, I want to, since we had, so I kind of motivated why we need to go beyond just dark matter only simulations because clearly there's some uh, discrepancy between uh, what the cold dark matter simulations predict what uh, observations are. So there's kind of two ways forward. You can either go and uh, consider alternatives to the cold dark matter hypothesis, so consider warm dark matter or interacting dark matter, um, or you can go beyond just uh, dark matter only simulations and start including baryonic physics. So in this talk, I'm not going to talk about this left uh, branch. Instead, I'm going to go towards uh, uh, what happens when you include uh, baryonic physics. So that is uh, a great thing to do, and it's very exciting, but it's also much more um, difficult and much more messy than just the pure gravitational problem. So now this is kind of highlighted here by this figure that I uh, sort of found a talk by one idea, which is just showing like a really, uh, in one slide, uh, a messy slide on purpose, like how uh, the kind of complicated interrelated physics that it's affecting all these things. So of course you have uh, your interstellar medium from which uh, molecular clouds form, those form stars, like the stars will affect the molecular clouds and disrupt them. The whole, the whole um, system is supported by turbulent pressure, which is not, the fortune is not very well understood. These stars then uh, explode or you just emit ionizing radiation that affects them. Um, there's going to be complex remnants that can affect the surrounding gas. And then that gas, of course, in some cases gets blown out and uh, you know, starts polluting other systems. And this whole, this whole system becomes like a much more uh, messy problem. And, uh, in order to really properly address how this affects the underlying dark matter, you have to actually understand a lot of the large portion of, the, of this physics. So it's, uh, it's more difficult. Um, before we get to all this treatment, there's actually just a question of how do you treat the hydrodynamics 
So it's not even just even talking about hydrodynamics, so a con uh, hydrodynamic conservation equation instead of solving just the Poisson's equation. Now we are solving this uh, these other equations that shouldn't be so much different, not not that much more difficult. But it turns out even this small system, uh, we don't really know perfectly how, how well this, how to solve that. There's uh, different approaches. The smooth particle hydrodynamics is a Lagrangian approach where you can try to solve it on an Eulerian mesh with adaptive mesh refinement, and these don't always give the same answer even when you have the same initial conditions. And more recently, a Fort has developed this moving mesh code, this Arevo code, which is kind of combining some of these uh, features, um, some, of the, um, some of the advantages of the Eulerian method with some of the advantages of the Lagrangian um, mesh. So, so, so far it's been clearly demonstrated that these two don't agree with each other, these two don't agree with each other. It's not so clear yet how, how these compare to each other. But anyways, it's, uh, we don't even properly know how to just do this uh, first system. Right. So, but going beyond that, um, even if we just th think we uh, know how to treat the hydrodynamics, then there's still the question of how do you actually treat all this complicated additional physics. So you want to allow the gas to cool. There's metal-dependent cooling. Your answers will depend somewhat on that. You have to input some kind of prescription for star formation that you usually calibrate to for example, a tenic Schmidt relation. Um, and then, of course, the biggest effect probably is the supernova, uh, or stellar or supernova or AGN feedback um, that can affect the subsequent evolution of the gas. So I couldn't resist uh, throwing in some slides from uh, some of my more recent um, AMR simulations. So this is actually not really directly related to the dark matter aspect, but I just wanted to show you there's some uh, things I'm doing with, with the ENZO simulation. These are full box AMR simulations. This is at redshift two, and this is just showing uh, gas surface density of uh, some spiral galaxies in these, uh, these boxes. So I kind of, uh, just a, kind of as a teaser for the kind of work that I'm uh, doing right at the moment. They're making a kind of realistic looking uh, spiral galaxies. And actually when you compare them to, uh, sort of <coughs> measure what the sizes of these galaxies are, and compare them to uh, observational uh, measurements of galaxy sizes, they actually turn out to be uh, doing pretty well. So it seems like we're actually starting to make progress in uh, simulating uh, disk galaxies and fully cosmological um, simulations with uh, AMR. So but going back to the dark matter story, so if you want to understand what is the effect of this hydrodynamic physics on the underlying dark matter structure, um, there's kind of there, you can find contradictory answers depending on uh, how the physics is implemented. So an example is the central density profile that we already talked about. Um, the dark matter only prediction, again, is, this is again the logarithmic density profile. So here from a dark matter only simulation, you get the NFW profile. If you have a situation though where you allow a lot of gas to cool and sink to the center, you can get what's called the adiabatic attraction. It steepens the dark matter density distribution and you get something that's closer to isothermal. So a steepening of the central density profile. On the other hand, recently people have uh, implemented a quite violent uh, supernova feedback description in which gas is blown out. A lot of gas is blown out from the center of these halos uh, quite repeatedly. And uh, in, this, in this work, um, and it's been seen in other simulations like this as well, uh, the, dark, the dark matter density is so much flattened in terms of the, the dark matter can uh, adjust to this very rapid, expulsive uh, expulsion of a lot of gas from the center. And so in this case, you actually get a reduction of central dark matter density. So depending on how you implement the physics, you get um, different answers. Another example of that is the, just the abundance of subhalos. So and you can imagine that maybe having a baryonic condensation inside of the double dark matter subhalo would make it more resilient to tidal disruption and therefore increase the abundance of dark matter in the center. And this was reported here in a hydrodynamic galaxy formation simulation by Romano Diaz. Uh, inside 30 kiloparsecs of the red line, the abundance of subhalos is about a factor of two larger in simulations that include baryonic cooling versus simulations that are pure dark matter. On the other hand, the counterexample exists as well. If you imagine that you remove the dense central density in these uh, subhalos, and you might make them more susceptible to tidal disruption, especially if they are actually interacting uh, with, the, with the disk, with the stellar disk, which is commonly not included in the, in the dark matter-only simulations. So here, in some work by Peña Rubia, he found the exact opposite effect. Um, this is not based on simulations. This is more of a semi-analytical treatment based on sort of uh, idealized uh, calculations and uh, here he sees that the abundance, when you have a shallow density profile of the sub the abundance drops by almost an order of magnitude. Well, half an order of magnitude at least. Uh, right, so again, you can get contradictory or different answers depending on how exactly you implement the physics. Mm. So I didn't want to um, you know, give the impression that we can't really do anything. So with the, uh, in, here's an example of a hydrodynamic simulation that actually 
does give a fairly realistic looking this galaxy, and I'll show what I mean by realistic looking, it actually compares fairly well with, with observational constraints. Um, this is, was a, the error simulation, which was run by some of my collaborators, Javier Aguides and Pierre Maidal and Lucio Meyer and uh, other collaborators. This is a, an SPH simulation, so it uses the Lagrangian hydrodynamics formulation and uh, includes an addition, it's also a zoom in, so just like we saw earlier, the Galactia simulation, but it's a zoom in on one galactic halo, but now it also includes all of their gas physics, <coughs> with their star matter particles, uh, gas particles, and star matter particles. Of course, when you include all this extra physics, you, you can't do as a high of a resolution, so you end up with particle masses of 10 to the 5 solar masses or so. But it includes a lot of this uh, additional physics and cooling star formation, supernova feedback, and particular prescription. And it results, as I mentioned, in a, in a galaxy uh, like our Milky Way that actually looks uh, remarkably like uh, observational constraints. So I'm just going to end this uh, movie here because it just goes on for quite a while. Um, this is what it looks like at the end of the simulation. And then uh, and I showed these, uh, just this comparison. So if you actually observe it through using you know, a radiation transfer post-processing system and do an actual observation of it, what it would look like, you can measure a bulge to disk ratio, and that agrees it's 0.35, so that agrees pretty good with uh, you know, the measurements for a typical spiral galaxies. You can look at it as right on the Tully Fisher relation, um, so very compares very favorably with uh, observational uh, measurements. It has a fairly shallow, a fairly flat, shallow, shallowly falling rotation curve. Again, in pretty good agreement with the observational data in the Milky Way, and its stellar mass is also um, pretty good. So this is again uh, this is, uh, an area where <coughs> simulations have often had problems. They have tended to produce way too many. So why does this one not have it? It's the I think it's the implementation. It's a combination of like having higher resolution and the particular kind of implementation of feedback. So it's very. Uh, so you saw you saw wind. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So they do and. Uh, it, it's uh, using the Stinson feedback where you essentially turn off cooling. It's like a pretty, uh, right. pretty yeah. intense. Yeah. 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 Definitely putting in the, the supernova feedback by hand, which appears to be um, currently at least somewhat necessary. Um, right, so uh, this was an example of a simulation that actually has produced somewhat uh, realistic um, uh, outcomes. So in the following, I want to just give two examples of where taken results from the, uh, these kind of hydrodynamic galaxy formation simulations that seem to be uh, doing a fairly good job and seeing how they affect um, the uh, predictions or our understanding of what the dark matter distribution is and how that affects our understanding of dark matter. Um, so the first one is the, the baryonic, um, the too big to fail problem that I mentioned before. So just as a reminder that is the this uh, overabundance of very massive, dense sub -halos. In fact, that every one of these halos seems to have a population of these that is not explained. So you can imagine that having a system, a hydrodynamic system in which supernova feedback has removed a lot of gas from the centers of halos um, mm -hmm. can help, and they can help in two ways. One is that it would reduce, remove gas from the center, or remove dark matter from the center by lowering its density profile, and so that would lower its uh, curve directly, so that goes in the right direction. But you would also probably increase the uh, tidal disruption probability as they interact with the central um, baryonic condensation, because they have you know, less deep, less concentrated mass distribution. So that could, again, disrupt some of these systems that are, that are puzzling in the dark matter only one. Um, so to do this, we actually did not, and this is some work I did with uh, um, Alison Brooks and Adi Solotov and Dan Hooper. So for, for this, we didn't actually use the area simulation, but we used a simulation that is very similar. It's also a gasoline um, SDA simulation um, with the same kind of physics implemented. Um, and so and as a result, you can already see what I just described. If you look here, the solid black lines are the same kind of circular velocity curves going on to by the kiloparsec, which is, as you saw in the previous plot, kind of where we have observational constraints. And these are for actual gas hydrodynamic simulations, and the blue dash lines are for the dark matter only satellites. And so you can see, indeed, see this kind of uh, reduction in the maximum circular velocity. So this is going in the right direction, as I mentioned, but also you're going to make them more um, subject to tidal disruption. So we took, so these kind of simulations don't have enough resolution to really resolve all of the sub that you need in order to really demonstrate that there is a missing satellite, a too big to fail problem. And so instead what we did is try to see whether or not by applying the prescription that was kind of calibrated to this simulation for how much this effect is, if we apply such a prescription to the actual dark matter only simulation at very high resolution, whether that can um, explain the too big to fail. But what specifically was happening to variants in, in this simulation? Excuse me, what is happening? Like what specifically was happening? Yeah. So in this case, there is cooling of the gas that's in the center of X stars, and then there's a supernova feedback that is in the 
Yeah, fairly rapidly, right? So, so on the time scale that's short compared to the dynamical? So yes, that's right. It's, kind of, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a first. But I have to say, there is kind of a, I don't think this is a completely um, settled problem yet. You know, because clearly some people have been finding this in, in the simulation, and then there's other people that are have other. Yeah, right. And there's even Impulsive. also calculation that are saying that you, even with an extremely impulsive injection of variance, you don't get this kind of reduction. So, so gasoline will see the find this, right? Mm -hmm. It's all the No, that's not true. Um, for example, um, Ramses has also seen this. Well, they had a slightly different implementation, not an explosive supernova type of implementation, but they also found a reduction of. Uh, Who's done it? Um, it's Tessier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's not the first author of the paper. Right. And talked about it today. Um, yeah. Right. Um, right. So we, we uh, essentially uh, kind of calibrated the prescription for how much uh, mm -hmm. of the central, how much the central density, how much the center velocity. At one kiloparsec is reduced due to the baryonic physics and applied that to the simulations that would be allowed to run. So actually, first to show you that there is still kind of a, a too big scale problem in via Lactia, that's what this plot is showing. So we kind of just uh, from the literature took a relation between the expected luminosity of four galaxies and their mass and converted the subgale mass into, into a luminosity, that's what's shown here. And then this is the circular velocity at one kiloparsecs. And in this red box, the via Lactia simulation has 20, 28 satellites in this region. Whereas in the Milky Way, there's five LMC, SMC, Sagittarius, which is in the process of being disrupted, versus a minor and Draco. And this is complete because we're talking about fairly bright systems. So there could be maybe one or two hiding behind the Milky Way plane. But it's not like these are these faint, ultra, uh, these low surface bright galaxies that we just haven't detected yet. These have been known for quite a long time. Yeah. So this is, this, is a, uh, this is essentially the two big to fail problem. So once you, so now we have for each of these subhalos in the simulation, we actually have their orbital history, so I know how far into the center they went, how many pericenter passages they underwent. And so we can apply this kind of prescription that we calibrated to the baryonic simulation that both, first of all, re re lowers these points just directly because we've ex expelled a lot of uh, matter from the center, and then also we can judge which of them should have been highly disrupted if the simulation properly had included the baryonic disk and had all these baryonic effects. So when you do that, indeed, um, you kind of solve the problem because now all of a sudden you only have a few systems remaining in this box comparable to the number of uh, systems in the Milky Way. And a lot more of these then are tidally disrupted, so you don't have all of these really bright systems that would have shown up. Um, most of them are tidally disrupted because they passed so close to the galactic, to the halo center that even though they were not disrupted in the galactic simulation, if we had accounted for you know, a baryonic disk, they would have been disrupted. Um, and that's very, uh, very faint, and there's a lot of systems that would not be luminous just because they never uh, reached a sufficient mass for their gas to cool given a unique background. So this um, is one example of how baryonic physics can you know, help with uh, puzzling features of the so, dark. Okay, say that. Um, yeah. is, is it that part that the higher cycle speed halos are less dense? Mm -hmm. Sorry, so say is, it, is, it, is it the part that the higher circular speed halos are less dense? They become less dense because they have their, because there's this injection of baryons and therefore the. But, but if I just take, well, I, 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 I don't know what the scaling is in the fourth, but if I took m and goes at the speed of the fourth, right, then I would imply that m over r cube was lower, right? Um, yeah, but so this, that would hold um, even in a dark matter only simulation, and you see the problem in there as well. So you have this additional. So you do have to somehow lower um, the central density. And or disrupt them in order to. But I was wondering whether, I don't understand whether the higher cycle speed halos were more susceptible to tidal disruption. Um, that's true because they tend to be on orbits that um, lead them in closer to the center. Yeah. I mean, they're more susceptible to dynamical friction as well as, as, as you get close to the uh, mass of the most people, and they, uh, they're more likely to be disrupted. Right, so that was the. Um, that was the first example. So the second example I wanted to uh, go over is um, what's going on at the galactic center, the dark matter distribution at the galactic center. So this is, of course, motiv motivated by, so this is kind of going back to the dark matter detection efforts, the indirect detection. This is going, uh, it's motivated by this, um, this reported signal of a line in the gamma rays at 130 GB. Those this year, first pointed out in this paper by Crystal Feininger, and a bit later by Sue Pinkbeiner, and uh, many others have also um, papers pointing out this feature and analyzing it. And so what it is, is just if you go out to 130 GB, and you look at certain regions towards the galactic center quite close to um, 
very galactic center, there seems to be an excess of, uh, of photons right around 30, 130 GeV, fairly peaked. Um, that is kind of hard to explain, which is just astrophysical mechanisms. Um, you don't really expect kind of a, a line at 130 GeV. Um, of course, this got people in the dark matter annihilation community very excited because you do kind of expect such a feature in dark matter annihilation. <coughs> Most of the time, the dark matter annihilation will produce kind of a broad gamma ray spectrum, a continuum photon. Um, but there also should be a two-body annihilation process. Of course, you can't get it directly because the dark matter particle is neutral, so it doesn't directly bubble through the photons. But through new processes, you can get you can get out to two photons, which would have the energy of the mass of the dark matter particle. The dark matter particle will stop to have a mass of around 100 GeV. So that that, with the exception of the fact that you would expect a lot of continuum photons um, that you should have detected first, having such a feature at 130 GeV is kind of something that people have proposed for a long time to, as a possible signal from dark matter annihilation. So there are definitely some dark matter models in which you, for particular reasons, suppress the contribution of continuum photons. They wouldn't be sort of the standard vanilla uh, you know, supersymmetric dark matter, but the theorists are invented, and it's definitely easy to, for them or for people to write down models in which you can actually suppress these continuum uh, photons to get them only the gamma ray, uh, only these lines up. So that, this is still, I think, a viable explanation. Of course, there's still, before you can really believe this, there's still other issues that you really have to address, and I'd be happy to talk about them in more detail maybe after the talk. I mean, one of them, the big one, is the, is the possibility of an instrument systematic, as you as have probably heard, that when you look at a particular subset of photons that are arising from the Earth's limb, which where they were produced by cosmic rays interacting with um, particles in the Earth's atmosphere, at a particular incidence angle on the, uh, on the Fermi lat, device, there also is kind of a signal for, for a line. So that's that's very worrisome, at the same energy. So that, that's very worrisome. I don't think you can really believe the signal until you can fully under, understand this, uh, this instrument systematic. Uh, and then going beyond that, there are also some astrophysical explanations um, that you know may work. They don't seem to be completely uh, uh, satisfying at the moment. So, uh, so it's still worth, I think, thinking about um, what the dark matter annihilation interpretation is. The first, the uh, the first thing you notice, though, is that when you actually look at the angular distribution of, of these photons, they don't, they're not exactly centered. So in uh, latitude, they are. They're pretty symmetric around latitude zero. But in longitude, they're kind of offset to one side. So they seem to be offset by about a degree and a half. Um, and so at first, I think people knew that as a strike against dark matter and annihilation, you really have to expect the dark matter density to rise really towards the center, and it should not really be offset. Um, but that's what motivated me to look at this in the numerical simulations that include uh, baryonic physics, but of course you need to compare to kind of a control. And so for that, I use both the via lacte and the g -Halo simulations, but also the Aris star simulation, which is um, the dark matter only counterpart to Aris. So I think Annalisa was actually visiting here recently, she I'm sure talked about uh, the simulation. So it's exactly the same initial conditions, there's no gas physics, and so you can do a direct comparison. So we did this, we actually just looked straight at the, at the center in the Aris simulation. These are now slices of the dark matter density field um, X, Y, Y, Z, and uh, all the three uh, Cartesian slices. And what's shown is in the, the white cross gives the center of the potential, the dynamical center, and then the, uh, the red cross indicates the position of the maximum dark matter density. So in all the dark matter only simulations, the two are pretty much consistent. They're right on top of each other within one gravitational self commitment. But in the Aris and the hydrodynamic simulation, it seems to be um, somewhat removed uh, more by more than uh, two or three gravitational self -linking. And it doesn't really, so how I actually did this is just put the particles on a grid and then smooth the grid and then determine the maximum density position um, in these smooth um, images. And it doesn't, just to show that it doesn't depend so much on how you smooth it, um, as was shown here, as, as a function of the smoothing kernel width. So you always get this offset at two or three times the gravitational softening. It also isn't a, uh, a fluke, it doesn't just appear in the final output of the simulation. If you look at it as a function of time, it seems to grow around the redshift of one and two, as you can see here, this is the gravitational softening, so it's about three or so. Whereas in the dark matter only run, it remains below one gravitational softening for the entire duration. Um, so this is a kind of going in direction of, uh, if you wanted to explain the dark matter, the, galactic, the lines in the galactic center in terms of dark matter annihilation, you wouldn't want to argue against that just based on the fact that it's offset. Um, it's not saying that therefore the line is dark matter annihilation, but just uh, don't use it as a, an example. So just a few more uh, words on this uh, offset. So if you look at it, how it behaves as a function of time, it's, not, it's clearly not um, 
moving around in like a very nice orbital way. It doesn't so sometimes it splits into two. So it's, what it's showing is just kind of the um, isodensity contours of dark matter and then the sort of 95th percentile is showing in here with these red points. And the, in the last two panels, I just plugged actually, I'm zooming in on it here, I'm just showing that this structure or whatever it, whatever is producing this offset peak is not a balanced structure. It's not some kind of remnant that is orbiting around the center of the actual potential. Um, and that's what's shown here because I just isolated all particles within one softening of the offset and then plotted those same particles just uh, 1.5 megameters later and they've already dispersed throughout the one point or about the two kiloparsec box. But the offset remains at a different position. So it's somehow, uh, it's not a coherent, gravitationally balanced structure. It must be something that is like excited over and over. And there, um, what comes to mind is some kind of a resonant interaction, for example, with the stellar bar. So if you have a, 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 a departure from axis symmetry in the stellar distribution, as we have in this galaxy, there's a, a stellar bar. It can actually um, capture particles in resonant orbits around it. Um, so here's an example from some work by Severino and Clippen. Particles on a co-rotation resonance, they would be in a ring, but they could be, you know, non-homogeneities within this ring that would lead to a dark matter uh, maximum uh, along a certain direction. So what's the dark matter mass versus the stellar mass inside the um, It's dominated by the stars. Yeah. How's the dark matter part of the star? Well, it has a different initial orbit, so the, so this is coming in. What, yeah. One question that comes to mind is, is does the magnetic field oh, that's offset depend on um, how rapidly we turn gas into stars. Yeah, we haven't investigated that because we we have one uh, simulation here. So it might also be in the stars. Like if you looked at yeah, it, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we ha we haven't looked at this, but it could be that just a small fraction of the stars are in that, so they wouldn't show up as like a very noticeable. I mean, if I make the same kind of projections as star, there's no noticeable peak of stars inside of this. But uh, the dark matters are moving, you know, moving on a relatively well, random orbit. So if you do the same thing with the stars. I mean, they are formed in a different way. They form at a very collapsed pool wing. No, I understand. Yeah, the yeah. initial conditions are a bit different, but the stars are also somewhat going to be real. Like, yeah, but the stars are also moving around in the, you know, the, the circular velocity, I think, and the dark matter particles are moving you know, in the velocities given by the entire potential. So at the center, it's not really quite yeah. equivalent. I mean, I agree that they're both collisional systems, and some stars mm -hmm. should also be captured in a resonant around the bar. I, I, would, I would think the same effect should be. Well, that's what a bar is. Yeah, <laughs> the bar itself, <laughs> then you could have particles that are trailing in. Um, so the reason why I bring up, I don't think I would uh, show this bar as a possible explanation if I hadn't found that actually the direction towards this dark matter offset happens to be aligned with the bar, with the, with the direction of the stellar bar. So if actually, I can go into the simulation, I can know at every time what is the orientation of the stellar bar, and I can just calculate what is the, the vector from the galactic center to the dark matter offset. And at early, and I can calculate what is the distribution of angles at different times. Um, so at early times, uh, when there isn't really this offset, uniform, but then once this offset um, becomes dominant, then it's very clearly aligned in terms of the angle between the two is, is close. And then also I can look at just an orbital, do an orbital analysis by just looking at what is the position of this dark matter offset as a function of time, and if I just uh, I'm try to fit, essentially, um, an oscillatory signal to that, if the chi squared of that fit is maximized nicely at these uh, periods, which are just being a harmonics of the fundamental period. Um, which has the same period as the stellar bar. So that just kind of, uh, to me, it's not proof that these dark matter particles are actually in a lock in a resonance with the dark matter, with the bar. I think I have to actually analyze the frequencies to show that. But this is pretty circumstantial evidence that um, it has something to do with the stellar bar. Um, in terms of the annihilation, it doesn't really, it's not really a strong enough effect by itself to explain the offset, I don't think. So at least if I made the dark matter annihilation map, this is what this is showing. Clearly, the highest luminosity region is somewhat offset from the, from the galactic center, but the contrast, at least at the resolution that we have in the simulation, is only a factor of tens of percent. Whereas, in order to explain the signal from Fermi, you need probably a factor of two. So, the, the only thing I, I would say about here is that our simulations obviously don't have um, arbitrarily high resolution. And so, if you had much higher resolution, maybe you could resolve the, the resonance structure, if it really is a resonance, uh, better, and you could maybe pull out, uh, maybe you would find a higher density. Right, so that brings me to my conclusions. Um, I talked in the beginning of the talk about just uh, ultra high resolution dark matter only simulations, and they predict an enormous amount of um, substructure, both in 
configuration space and the velocity space. And I gave some examples of how this is important for uh, direct and indirect detection of dark matter. Um, but I think I also convey to you that by themselves, these, are, these kind of simulations are, even though they've been tremendously useful, and some of them might continue to be so, but on galactic scales, I feel like there's too much other physics that is important for them to, to really remain really useful. So I think you have to go beyond them. There's two ways of going them beyond just cold dark matter only simulations, and I discussed baryonic physics as one example. Um, and I, 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 sh I showed you two examples. One was how baryonic physics can help with the too big fail problem, and the second one is how it can modify the distribution of dark matter in the galactic center. So thank you for paying attention, and uh, I'll take more questions if there are any. to like an SPH simulation, you mean? Are you talking about the mass of the dark matter, of the gas particle versus the mass of the dark matter particle? And the stellar particles are less than the gas. Yeah, so, I mean, for the SPH simulations, it's a little bit tricky because people usually use like very, very soft, small um, gravitational softenings in order to get the height, because it's usually tied to the, to the, um, the SPH smoothing, you get like a minimum. So in order to really dissolve all the gas physics, you have to choose a pretty small softening. So I don't think you can you can argue that you can go arbitrarily small in terms of the softening that you can apply. But it's not all just uh, SPH. You know, you might have a simulation. I didn't really talk about them here, but in our area codes in which you don't actually have a gas particle mass, so you can resolve much much smaller scales. In fact, there's lots of simulations in which the system is, ends up being completely just dominated by the baryons. You have much much finer resolution in the gas than you have in the dark matter. So in, in principle, I don't think. So in this picture of baryonic effects, the, uh, it's, it's mass dependent, uh, right? So that for big galaxies, there's probably this adiabatic kind of pulling in. Mm -hmm. And then there's this question about the size of the effect in the, in the big dwarf region. But once you get to the little tiny dwarfs, there's so little stellar mass mm -hmm. um, that the, the baryonic effects there may very small. Can you buy that from the... Uh, um, yeah, it depends. I mean, there's also the question of, like, what we see is maybe not necessarily all the barren, like, uh, that would affect that ever happened to them. Right, be, yeah. Maybe they were there at some stage, right? Yeah, exactly. They are much <coughs> longer there, so you could still affect, uh, imagine big effects in those cases. Of course, if you get to arbitrarily small dark matter halos, it's unlikely that the barren, so they're never even going to cool in those halos. So right. It's there. But even in the more massive halos, and people people say that adiabatic contractions would happen, but there's also measurements in the centers of, uh, of clusters that seem to indicate you know, it's shallower in the So it's not, um, it's not clear that it really is so straightforward. So you're a Santa 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not a scientist right now, but uh, no, no, I mean, talking, uh, well, I mean, which part would Joel particularly object to? Well, just the adiabatic contraction that these things actually Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he has to come around. All right. Yeah. Uh, so it may be too much to ask, but for the for the offset, mm -hmm. uh, is there a bar like one of the points in, in our in, in our Yeah, we do have a bar, and it does at this point away. It's a few degrees pointing away from uh, from our lab side, but it actually is pointing in the opposite direction of where the camera line opposite is. But I think to some degree, I mean, you don't expect any kind of resonance to be directly on the bar if you're trailing or keeping it. So I think it's totally okay to have that. Um, it would be like that. There's a you really naively expect the co-rotation resonance to I mean, the co-rotation resonance happens in our active right because you kill more six out, so that's not exactly so maybe it's like a bar that's inside of a bar and there's a person with that. So it, it, not all the questions here are completely uh, clear and solved. Alright, any more questions? Uh, so we'll have uh, cookies upstairs now and then